love that lifted you this evening? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Can you look back over your life and see a time when you know that your soul was in danger? Yes. And that you had to look above and realize that Jesus completely saves. Yes. Amen. That third verse says, He will lift you by His love out of the angry waves. Why is that? He's the master of the sea. Billows His will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be. Be saved today. Amen. I can report to you tonight when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. The world needs to see proof of regeneration in the Christian. We literally may be the only Bible that they see. Many people, as I observe them from day to day, from place to place, I see that one thing is true of the world. They are in a lost state. Yes. I hope you listen carefully Sunday and you understand that the world is in a fallen condition and had not love lifted you, had not you been lifted by Jesus Christ and his love and his supreme sacrifice, all that he has done, we can't even begin to imagine. Had that not been you, you would be in that same fallen state. The world needs to see that there is a reality, a reality that is true and real and firm uh, in serving Jesus Christ. I pray that we are there. Sometimes in my spirit, I just believe that there are uh, way more, but sometimes I, I don't know. I just trust that God has here who he wants here and I trust that those who are here and being fed will go and share with others that is the model of the growing and the vibrant and living church amen, amen. Matthew uh, Mark three fourteen, and he ordained the twelve that they should be with him that he might send them forth to preach and to teach that they might cast out devils, that they might heal the sick, that they may raise the dead. He ordained the twelve that they would know him first, and then they would go for him secondly, and then they may show him to others thirdly. Amen. So we are here still celebrating and understanding that God has given us this push focus. It is with that that I want to open up our final lesson of Acts tonight. I pray that you have been blessed. I pray that you have been uh, uh, enlightened. Uh, you have been encouraged and maybe even challenged, I would pray. In fact, we may be here in just a moment, but challenged by this book uh, to understand where we are as the latter day saints of God, the Latter-day Church. We're not in the first century anymore. We have moved on some 2,000 plus years. So what have we learned in 2,000 plus years, church? That's the, that's the question. Amen. Y'all don't need to be quiet tonight. Say amen. It's, it's, it's right. It's right. So let's open with prayer and then we'll get to some questions and, and uh, then we'll get to this final chapter. Amen. Dear God, I thank you this evening for another day, another time to share your word. And I, I trust, Lord, that as we open your word up, that you open us up and you show yourself and, and speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. Lord, challenge us, move us in the direction we are to go. It, it, I am convinced, God, and thank you for the persuasion and being persuaded that it is your word that makes all the difference. Uh, I love music, God. I love fellowship. I, I love food, <laughs> Lord. I love all kind of things that generally we think of with church, but paramount at the top has to be your word. 
your word makes all the difference in the world. Help us to hold on to your word and help, Lord, not only for us to have grasp and knowledge of verses and be able to recite them, but, Lord, that those verses recite us and that they have a hold on us. In Jesus' name, let us be changed and transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove that which is good and acceptable, that which is the good and acceptable will of God. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First question I want to share with you before we get to, into the text here tonight is as we have gotten to the end of this book of Acts, as we have gotten to the end of this book of Acts, what are some distinct differences you see in the church shown in Acts uh, and then in the church today? not on your handout. It's, it's, it's on mine. Sorry. So I'm asking you, what are some distinct differences that you see in the church as we have gone through 28, we'll have gone through 28 chapters after tonight? What are some distinct differences you see in what the church was then and where we are now? Yeah, not chapter 1 to chapter 28. Okay. Yeah, so first century church, this church, the church of today. We're less dedicated and less faithful. Less dedication, less faithfulness. Thank you. Um, today, the church is, is uh, worldwide versus at the at that time, it was still expanding. Um, so, a lot of people forget that the elements of the church that you've seen, like the persecuted church, Ephesus, and all those things, well, you, we have a persecuted church in China, in, in, in Muslim countries, I'd say those underground churches more reflect the church under duress like they were during this time. It's more during the birth pains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. that's, that's what they're dealing with now, even though they're, we're established now or that far removed, but yet there's, there's always been part of the church has been heavily the okay. true church been persecuted, even throughout I mean the whole time. All right. So, Minister Smith said that the church is far spread, more uh, spread out than what it used to be. Uh, at the onset of this book, the church was Jerusalem, and then it spread uh, to other portions of that world at that time. But now, the church is worldwide. He also said that persecution is a staple uh, that the true church does face. Uh, we may not see it as much here in America yet, uh, but it is certainly seen in places like China and countries where, as I read in one book, uh, sometimes people have had their tongues cut out for sharing the gospel. Uh, one book even shared with me, and I remember that grabbed me so, so hard that people were laying in a, it wasn't a nice edifice, but just an underground room uh, that they had almost like a, a bouncer guarding the door. And people were praying before service and laying in tears because of their uh, desiring God to protect them and, and, and because somebody they knew maybe had lost their life for sharing the gospel. So persecution is a staple. One thing, too, to keep in mind, the Western world, especially America, got founded because of religious freedom, mm -hmm. partly. You know, there was a group of people that were trying to be practiced and worshipped the way they wanted to. Mm -hmm. They couldn't. Sure. Restraints. Yeah. Sure. That's still in our history, if, if they haven't gotten rid of that page. 
but uh, yes, um, our church, uh, the church, so to speak, I see, yes, sir, the church, so to speak, uh, the pilgrims who came over were persecuted in their home countries uh, for their faith and their idea of wanting to worship God, not having to worship a man, but worship God. And so that is in our history books. And that is before the Founding Fathers. That's before the Declaration of Independence. That's well over a hundred and some years before that. That's 1620. Uh, and they wanted to worship. And we did go over some of that. When How many of you remember the classes on, on why we are Baptists? Anybody remember that? We had them in our uh, uh, Sunday School BTU Institute several uh, years ago. So, yes, sir. That's a great point. If you couldn't hear him in the back, he said, uh, basically, in a nutshell, that people are not preaching and teaching the word of God, and that the, the, the term Christian is a very loose term now, um, and, and that he's been to some churches in Dayton and Columbus within a year and a half, you said, yeah. and here, and, and what we get here is, is a lot different than what he had seen some other places. I heard somebody share that there is a lot of self-help and philosophy type yes. things that are shared and man's interpretation on a verse. Uh, so that, that, that's a good thing. And I think we, you know, uh, Marlon and, and, and others who are here, I, I agree with you 100% uh, that sometimes we have input ourselves into the scripture and rather than just allowing God to share his word and speak in a way that is that helps us to grow. I, I can take a verse and make all sorts of things out of it. And people have done that. Uh, so that is a distinct change in the church. People back then, I believe, if you read text, you understand people carefully or took care to uh, to try to share God's word and expound on it. Uh, in the correct way and I don't believe that sometimes today people have the respect for God's word and therefore they just treat it carelessly uh, Peter warned of that don't don't uh, share God's word don't lord over the flock don't do things that that misrepresent who God is because the chief shepherd will come and when he appears the first people that that really he will 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 look at and will be standing a a, far, a different accountability are pastors and preachers who have who have uh, scattered the sheep. Amen. And uh, we pray that that is not here. I do my best to prepare and and share with you guys, and it's not time to pump me up. I I simply want to do what God has told me to do. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Might as well throw prosperity in there too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're right. Prosperity preaching has overtaken a lot of people. Yeah. It has taken a lot of people over. If you weren't here, just came in. We are dealing. It's not on your page, but if you want to write it down, what are some distinct differences you see in the church shown throughout this these 28 chapters of Acts and the church that we are in today? I was listening to a gentleman just a few moments ago. And you all remember our study in Revelation. And he, he uh, said, uh, Jesus spoke to the church, I believe it was at Sardis, and said, you, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. That's a scary statement. You have the reputation, I think it's Revelation third chapter or fourth chapter, 
of being alive, but you're dead. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that some people in the church may think that they are living, they are part of a living organism, they are alive, yet their idea, and this goes right into our question, their idea of what alive is compared to what Jesus has said, two different things. Amen. Amen. So once again, that's the importance of understanding and saying, God, open your word to me. Let me let make let me make sure my life lines up with your word at all other costs. I have to at all costs. Let my life if I don't do anything else, let my life line up with your word. Next question is not on your page again. You can write it down. Is it possible that the church today for many is not as Christ intended. I think by what you've said, we all can answer yes. So what is our job then? Our job is to do the best we can to, uh, to have our church, amen, line up with Scripture. Amen. Amen. And I think that's one of the things that's kind of ironic tonight. That's one of the things that I first shared here at this church. Uh, the first Wednesday in August, six years ago. Amen. That we be plumb with God's word. Construct a contractor term. They snap that cord so that you can line up. You can line that board up, line up that wall, whatever you're building, whatever you're, you're, you're lining up. You know what? Lord, snap the cord on us. <laughs> Let me be plumb. Let us be plumb to your word. Amen. Well, let's get to the text. Verse 1, last chapter. You remember last week, uh, uh, they're on the boat. Paul told them not to get on the boat. He told them to wait. But they thought they had fair weather. And they took off anyway. And, and months and weeks later, they've been struggling in these ports. And there was a lot of sea going terms. In fact, I read chapter 27 is the most seafaring chapter in the Bible. It shares all kind of nautical words. And remember, I left you with this. I left you with this and I just shared this today with somebody in a parking lot. Amen. The Lord spoke this to me and I shared it with them. Sometimes God has to break the boat to get you to safety. Amen. They were going to kill the prisoners, all these soldiers, 276 people on the boat. They, the, the boat, they decided to, to run the boat ashore, and they ran into a shoal, a reef. And, and the boat, the front end of the boat got stuck, and the back end was beaten by the, the waves and the surf, and the boat began to break apart. Everybody could not swim. God had already told Paul, and Paul told the people, you all will live if you just listen and so the point was, again, sometimes God has to break things up to save people's lives. Amen. Wonderful point. So that brings us to, to this chapter. And when they were escaped, some had swam, swam the shore, swam, swam, swam. Then they knew that the inland or the island was called Melita. We call it Malta today. Verse 2, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. That's a complete difference to little to no kindness. Y'all catch the words, right? They showed us no little kindness. So they showed them tons of kindness. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he hath uh, escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Let's stop right there. So on your handout, it says going to Rome as a prisoner was more useful to God of Paul than going as an evangelist and a preacher. Now that may seem like a weird statement, but, but catch this. Paul was of more use to God 
as a prisoner than he was just by traveling by boat and saying, I'm going to preach to these people. What, what, what does that mean? Well, think about what he has said in uh, the letter to Philemon, the letter uh, to the Ephesians, and maybe the letter to the Philippians. He said, I, Paul, the, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul considered himself, first and foremost, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, meaning he is Lord over my life. Therefore, wherever he takes me, whether I'm shipwrecked or whether I'm beaten and left for dead, whether I'm in a prison, I'm, if I'm in his will, that was the big point last week, the safest place for me is in his will. I am his prisoner and he gives me my marching orders. Amen. Now, he had been prisoner for over two years and had been in jails and prisons and before tribunals and defended himself. And yet he calls himself a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray you call yourself that tonight. I pray you say, I am the Lord's servant. I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has apprehended me and I belong to him and he belongs to me. Amen. Amen. This is why many times Paul addresses himself, and there's your, there's your context. He realized after he was apprehended by Christ, he serves him. Amen. The Lord has called me. I serve him. I don't want to get into it, but I had to explain that to a person within the last week or so. They came up to me after something that I had done and kind of uh, uh, let me know in a, in, in a, in a way that, it wasn't appreciated, a few of the things that I said. And I had to remind them, I serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. I do what he tells me. Now, before y'all go, there wasn't nobody in here. You don't know him. You have no idea. So don't be like, who, what, who, no. It, just understand it. We have to get that. I'm his. So I do what he tells me to do to the best of my ability. Amen. And Paul has that. Acts 1-8. It's been in every handout except one. I know Sabrina's probably checked it just to make sure. It's been in every handout but one. But that's our focus scripture. Acts 1-8 is in fruition. So the gospel is being spread. Now they're on the island of Malta. Melita, as the text says. And, and they, have, they have gotten there because God had to break the boat. Amen. And some swim, swam, swum. And some floated in. Some of y'all last week, that'd be me trying to float in. Amen. Amen. So... And, and they are headed in the direction of Rome. What would did God promise Paul? He said, you will not what in Jerusalem? Die. You will make it to Rome to preach the gospel. That's why he could be confident in the storm. On a boat that was breaking apart. He could be confident in the storm and say, none of us are going to die. God promised me. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. I'm trying to move on. But watch this. When God promises you something, hold on to it. Take some time at the beginning of your day. Thank you, Lord. And, and remember his promises. God's been good to you, has he not? And he promises you that he will not leave you nor forsake you. So it, it doesn't matter if everybody else walks away. If he's with you, you're going to be all right. Amen. Amen. Now, real fast. This predicament. We, we read there they were shipwrecked. Get this, they're on the shore now. Now, you know how it is. You've been to a pool on a cooler day. It's still summer, but you get out and you're kind of cold and you wrap your towel around you. Maybe you've been even been swimming and, and it was too cold to swim, but you got in anyway. Some of y'all who are a little bit more adventuresome, amen. But you know what it's like to get in the water and then get out and you're cold. And so catch this, they're there on the shore that the ship is washing in what's left of it. People are crawling up onto the shore. They build a fire. And, and then uh, the, uh, Paul is getting wood. And as he's getting wood, it gets closer to the heat. A viper comes out of the bundle of, of, of wood and strikes on his hand. Then it said it didn't strike and recoil. It latched on and hung on. Yeah. So those of you who are afraid of snake, I know at least one in here. She and I talk about them frequently. She's raising her hand right now. Amen. 
And I, I just to get the idea, I watched a few videos of snakes striking. And when they strike the venomous ones, their mouth rears back and those fangs are ready for business. So put yourself in this position. It's cold. They're freezing. They're wet. They're trying to get warm. They're trying to get warm. And in trying to get warm, one of them ends up getting snake bit. People step back, making sure it doesn't get on them. He throws it into the fire. Then they sit back. I haven't got to that verse yet. And watch to see what's going to happen to him. Does that bring anything into mind? Go to 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. Do you see a correlation between what Luke has described in this book and all that Paul has been through and what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. Go there really quick. When you have it, say amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. And it reads, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. What is Paul saying to the Corinthian church and to us today? We have the gospel. Amen. And it is housed in earthen vessels. Then he said, now, these earthen vessels, they don't stand up against everything. They are shipwrecked, snake bitten, left for dead, beaten, prisoners. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. What is Paul saying to them? He's saying what he has lived. He is saying what he is living, that we go through some stuff, but in going through that stuff, we get opportunities to share the most glorious treasure on earth. Can I present to you tonight a simple idea, church, in the 21st century? Check it out. Here it is. Watch this. You go through some things so that you might reach somebody else with the gospel. Mm, thank you. Thank you, God. Everything you've gone through has not just been for you. Amen. There's some things God is has taken you through and is taking you through that you might get somebody else's attention. That he might get somebody else's attention. That you might be prepared when your path crossed with whoever that person is to speak a word to them. Because if you are saved, amen, if you are saved, then get this, you house the most glorious treasure ever it's not gold Amen. it's not silver it's not a large bank account it's not all the diamonds in the world it's not an oil, oil rig in the ground or, or whatever you want to call it it's not oil reserves but it is the gospel of jesus christ Amen. Amen. yes that puts a different uh, perspective on romans 8 28 doesn't it sure does and we know Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean it's always quoted as as not in the way that you're talking about. But it's always about individual, mm -hmm. but he's looking at the body. Oh yeah, not oh, just yeah. Okay. If if you didn't hear him in the back, he said that puts a different spin on Romans eight twenty eight. That it's not always an individual thing, but some things you go through is for the body of Christ to be built up and to be helped. Amen, amen. In, in fact, we can leave it at this. We don't have to understand everything on this side. Amen. There is a song that folks used to get happy about singing. We will understand it better yeah. by and by. Amen. Hallelujah. When the morning comes. Yeah. When all the saints of God together home. We'll tell what? The story of how we overcome. We'll understand it better by and by. Well, so in your, in your text here, on your, your notes, you see... That Malta, 58 miles off the coast of Sicily. You know, Italy looks like a boot, right? Y'all who paid attention in geography class, Italy looks like a boot. Now, they call these folks barbarians, but they're not barbarians, right? They're barbarians, and that use of that word, as you study the text, means they just had a, sim uh, a different 
dialect than did the Greeks and, of, and that of the Romans. So barbarian is a strong word for us. We think when we look at that word, we think of somebody that's ruthless or no manners or, or horrible acting or a caveman-like type person. But no, this just simply meant that they had a different language. Now, we know they're not barbarians by our standards because it said they showed them no little kindness. Amen. They didn't treat them like barbarians would do. Barbarians would have put them on a spit and roast them maybe. <laughs> Tied them up, chained them up, threw them in a cave. I don't know. But these people showed hospitality. Even with hypothermia, that's, that's in your notes, it could have set in those types of things. It, they showed them no little kindness. Now, in the meantime, here we go, Sister Garns. Paul is snake bitten. Amen. Now, I, I, I don't, we know what a snake does. Snakes going to be snakes. Why, why did that snake do that? Connect to Sunday. We're living in a fallen world. Snake bites are a result of sin. Amen. If a lion came through this door right now, y'all would run. I'd run. We'd be running. If he's hungry, it's a result of sin. The Bible says when sin is done away with, the lion will lie down with the lamb. That's going to be a weird sight based on what we're seeing, but we'll understand it better by and by. So watch this. With no sin, there will be no snake bites. But Paul is snake bitten. All these people then began to do something that people generally do. They do two things. They watch and then they question why something happened. Hear their minds. Hear their conversation. Well, the, he, he, the gods tried to get him in, in the sea and he escaped. And now ironically through fate, through luck, through bad luck, through witchery, whatever, he, he got through karma. They got the right guy. <laughs> they got him. Now y'all realize that if you get this, that all those words I just used, karma and fate and luck and, and evil, calling somebody evil or the evil caught up with him, those are not uh, uh, concepts that are, that are found in Scripture. All right? D just to be very simple with you, uh, and this is, this is not petty, but it is true. It, at Christmas time, I have found myself, I love the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. And it gets on down through that. And then it says, if the fates allow. Yep. And I always say, if the Lord allows. Amen. Amen. Fate is not over my life, Amen. but God is. Yes, that's it. All right. I get what they're saying, but I have to understand God decides what I do tomorrow. Amen. God decides if I even have a tomorrow. Right. And you too. Amen. So using those words, even though they can be cliche or or just something you're used to saying, they are not rooted and founded in Scripture. So these people are watching and saying, you know what, he must have been a murderer. He's a bad guy. The ocean almost got him, and he made it to shore, and guess what? Fate is caught up with him. So they stand back to watch and see what's going to happen. Mm. Y'all catch the picture, don't you? You ever seen that with somebody? I'm just going to watch what's going to happen with them. There's folks that just actually like to just watch and see what's going yeah, on. Lurkers. <laughs> Y'all ain't helping me tonight. You let something happen up on the corner. I've seen it. I've lived on Third Avenue all my life. Let something happen on the corner. Something happen in the middle of the block. Before long, you'll see some of your neighbors. I won't say any name. But they're like, yeah. And then they, they, then they go up the street. Let's see what's going on. Why? They want to see what's going on. Am I in here by myself? You know how neighborhoods are. God is sovereign. Watch this. So they watch Paul. Verse 6. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they looked a great while, they watched a long time. Amen. It should have been getting wood. They watched a long time and saw no harm come to him. Thank you. They changed their minds and said that he is a God. Now watch this. They're barbarous folks. They don't have some of the same understanding. They're watching to see what's going to happen to the Apostle Paul. They think that, you know what? He dodged one bullet, so to speak, but he didn't get this one. So they stood back and watched a great while. He about dropped over. 
I got think, let's put some put some funny on it. I got him at seven fifteen. Two step. Two step. No, that's gonna be about seven thirty. Look, see if his hands. Are. I think it looks like it's swelling. He didn't swell up. He didn't fall over. He didn't die. Y'all catch it? Y'all catch that? And then they said he is God. Now that is their way of saying there's something different about him. And get this, Paul has gone through all of that and what he's about to do so that they might see Christ. That's right. That's a purpose. Stop right there. Praise God. The difference between the early church and now, one of them is very simple. We need to recognize why we go through things. And then spin that thing around instead of saying, woe is me and, and horrible and all these things. But God, how can you get the glory from this thing? From what's happening with me? What's happening with my family? What's happening on my job? What's happening to me mentally, emotionally, financially, or physically, or even spiritually? How can I spin it around and at the end of the day, I can say to God, be the glory. Amen. You missed your chance right there. But when, in spite of it, to God be the glory. Now, I don't know what all you've been through. Only you know you. But you know where he's brought you from. At the end of the day, you need to be able to say to God, be the glory. How can I say thanks for, for all the things that he has done for me? Things so undeserved, yet he died to prove his love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to you. I've been sick bitten. I've been shipwrecked. I've been left for dead. I've been beaten. All throughout this book of Acts, Paul and the others have gone through some things. And at the end of the day, while they're waiting for him to fall over dead... To God be the glory. As he goes and picks up more wood, hallelujah, to God be the glory. As he lays it in the fire and people are whispering over, I think it's about time he's about to yield up the ghost. To God be the glory. He already told me and I believe his promises. He said I would not die in Jerusalem. But get this, I'm not going to die in Syracuse either. I'm not going to die in Malta. I'm not going to die aboard a boat. I'm going to Rome to preach the gospel. To God be the glory. Amen. Catch it, catch it, catch it tonight. So God sends favor. Amen. He favors Paul. He gives Paul favor. So watch this. In the same quarters where possessions uh, of the chief chief uh, man of the island uh, were possessions, I'm sorry, of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. Amen. Can y'all just say amen on that verse? They, they, they shipwrecked. They're they on a foreign island. They said it was barbarous folks. And everybody's receiving them courteously. Hey, man, I, I might take a, a detour for just a moment. But isn't it amazing how God can call some barbarians to receive you courteously, but your own folks won't treat you right? Amen. I had to put that one in there. Right, Watch this. That's when you know the Lord is favoring you. Sometimes your own folks won't do it. That's Jews right. have been given, he's a Jew, have been giving him all sorts of problems. Yeah. Yet the barbarians, God can make some folks that you don't even know yeah. treat you courteously, yeah. put you up in their house. Yeah. Amen. That's a part of where we should be as a church as well. Amen. We should say to God be the glory. If he's blessed us, then let us bless somebody else. Yeah. Amen. 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 So. If you check this, and it came to pass, assignment, here it is. Don't you love those Bible words? And it came to pass that the father, that's a Luke word, the father of Publius lay sick of a fever. Mm, amen. And of a bloody flux. That means dysentery. To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. While they were struggling in the sea and the boat was breaking apart, God already knew this man was going to be sick. God already knew he would bring 
the people safely to shore. God already knew they would sit back and watch him as he was snake bit. And God knew that the moment would come when Paul would lay his hands on this man and he'd be healed. In fact, if I'm correct, this is the only time you hear maybe once, maybe twice that he lays his hands on anybody in this book. All right. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. Word spread quickly. Did you hear about the folks that washed up on shore? Did you hear about the man that was snake bitten and, and nothing happened? Did you hear that he touched and he prayed and, and his God he healed Publius's father? Let, let's go over and see who he is. People here about you. People hear about the church. People hear about your dedication to the word. People hear about your prayers. People hear whether we believe it or not or even know it or not. People will hear what is done and it may invite or rouse their attention or their curiosity. It opened the door. And if, they, if you've checked back to the lessons, what was the whole point? The healings that happened in the book of Acts and other times were all the miracles that happened were always opening of doors to preach and share the gospel. Amen. Amen. Who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laid at us with such things as were necessary. So Luke writes. These people that came and were healed, they honored them with many honors. Amen. They, they didn't ask for gifts, but they just gave it to them. What can we say there? God favors. God blesses you. Amen. On the other side of the shipwreck is a blessing. Amen. Praise the name. Praise your name, Lord. The supplies that were given, they had lost stuff. And God Gave it back to them. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I hear that. I hear that. They had lost some things and God blessed them through some barbarians. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm encouraged. Amen. I am encouraged. God can take anything and anybody. So if you look at your text, this was probably Maltese fever and this was a big deal in first century. You all know then and in, in poor countries even now that there are things that people die of that we can go up to Walmart, be there in two minutes, buy it in two minutes or three minutes, be home and have taken it and be all right. But people die of those things because they have no medicine. They have no uh, aid. They have nothing that can help them. This calls to mind also in verse 10, the touching scene when Paul left the elders at Ephesus and the people were thankful for the divine working of God through Paul. God shows Paul favor again, not only him, but those who are with him. Amen. All right. Verses 11 and 12. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria. Somebody say patience. patience. Had they been patient at the beginning, they wouldn't have ended up in this. But had they not ended up in this, they wouldn't have met the people they met that needed help. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Amen. And from there, thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day, the south wind, that's a good wind, blew. And we came the next day to Petulia, uh, Petulio, or Petulia, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days and so went toward Rome. Amen. So verses 13 through 16. Notice quickly, they find brethren. So this also means the gospel has reached some of those places. They found others of like-minded faith. And you know what? That's important for us. Many times we will find that we are looking for others to identify with, but also those people may be looking for us as well. So I didn't want to miss this opportunity to one more time state Hebrews 11.25, or is it, did I miss do that? Hebrews 10.25. It's one of them. Let's turn there real fast. I think I got the wrong chapter. I sure did. It should be 10. Change that to 10. Sorry about that. Change that to a 10 so we don't have anything wrong. And what does it say in Hebrews 10, 
25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Once again, this importance of fellowship. When they got there, they joined up with other. They looked for other like-minded people of the faith, brethren. And that's important for us. I won't teach that lesson again, but it's important that I'm surrounded, you are surrounded with others who believe like me and can pray for me and I can pray for you, can share testimonies with you and you can share with me. That is the beauty of the church. And I think that is a big difference between then and now. I don't want to overstate this, but a, a couple came to our church several months ago and they gave us a compliment. They said it is always a good thing when you see people hanging around after church. So we've been to some churches and you see when the preacher, no sooner than he says, now may the grace of God and the, the doors and wheels are squealing and people are out. Parking lot, papers, <laughs> boom. But when you see people still talking and still fellowshipping and still ministering and still praying after the service is over for others and, and meeting up to go shopping and things like that, that is a sign that there is some health in that church. Amen. Amen. That's not to brag on us. That's just simply say that's what's in Scripture. To seek out other like-minded people and understand there's an importance in fellowship. Why would you not want to spend time with folks you're going to spend eternity with? All right now. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. We got to learn to love. Amen. We got to learn to get along with each other. We may not always agree on every single thing. You may Amen. say it's black. I may say it's blue. But at the end of the day, Jesus is still good. And we can agree Amen. on that and work through it. Amen. Brotherhood, sisterhood, fellowship. Amen. Now, notice that it gets to the, the part of the verse. It says, after they get there and they get to Rome, and, and it says, and from thence we, we found, brother, in verse 15, and then verse 16, and we came to Rome, and the centurion delivered the prisoners. So Paul has gotten to where he wanted to get to. He is in Rome to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. That means he was guarded separately by soldiers. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So who is he talking here? Who has he been talking to that's given him the most problems throughout these chapters from about chapter 11 on? Who is he speaking to? The Jews. Remember what I said a few moments earlier? It's, it's amazing when, when some barbarous folks will treat you better than your own countrymen. And so here we're going to get, it's going to come to a quick. Amen? So watch this. He said, I was delivered prisoner from the Jews in Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. He is saying, I did nothing wrong, nothing to be charged with death. They examined me, they found no charges, and they would have let me go, yet my own folks kept stirring the pot. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained, verse 19, to appeal unto Caesar. Y'all remember that a few chapters back? He made his appeal unto Caesar, and when he did that, it took it out of the hands of the Jews and put it in the hands of Rome. Caesar was the highest court in the land. Not that I had any ought to uh, accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you. He says, I want to see you Jews face to face because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Now, go back to our opening question. Let's make the connection. First century church and now. First century church, if you had the hope of Israel as your message, who is the hope of Israel? Jesus. Jesus. 
And what about Jesus? Jesus the Messiah. Amen. What about him? Jesus crucified, died, buried, and get it, and important, resurrected. The resurrected Christ. The hope of Israel. The Jews believed it, but they didn't believe he had already come. The Jews believed it. They believed in the resurrection, but they didn't believe what Paul said of Jesus Christ. He said, because of the hope of Israel, I'm behind bars. I'm in chains. The difference today is, do we go through some of those same things because of our hope in Christ? Not so much, but you all said, he said it earlier, and it's, it's, it's a great point. In other places, they do. In other places, they are, some have been murdered for their faith. Some have been martyred. Some have been maimed for their faith. Some have been had things happen to their livelihood, their businesses, their family. And we are seeing the fringes and the ripples of it. I hope you understand this tonight, Paint Creek. Everybody will not accept the Jesus of the Bible. Now, if you give them some other little knockoff Jesus, some other little gospel, something that is different than the Bible, they may be accepting of that. But if you preach it straight down the middle and say, this is what the book says. This is what I believe. This is what I stand on. You may be persecuted for your hope of Christ. And your hope in Christ. Amen. He wanted them to know that he bore no animosity against his fellow Jews in Jerusalem, but instead wanted to talk to these Jews in Rome. So he's shooting it to them straight. He said, I'm here in this predicament because of my belief that Jesus rose from the dead. And I preached Jesus and him crucified. Amen. Verse 20. Christ is the hope of Israel. Isn't that a wonderful connection to our Ye Shall Know the Truth series? Jesus, what's unique about him? He is fully God and fully man at the same time. That is the only way he could be the hope of Israel. He is God's only begotten son. But then if you look at Old Testament text, what does Isaiah 7, 14 say? Anybody find that and, and, and tell me what it says? Isaiah 7, 14. It's a, it's a Christmas sounding scripture, but it's actually just the prophecy. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, and over a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, thank you. Therefore a, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, and a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name. Emmanuel. Let's just deal with one, that one word, Emmanuel. We hear that at Christmas a lot, but it is a word that we need to, to, to stick with. Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. It, it ties perfectly together with John 1, 14. Write that beside that verse 20 note. John 1, 14. And the word was made what? Flesh. So how could God be with us if he didn't dwell among us? Amen. I can't be with you if I'm not here. Mm. Amen. I'm glad God didn't zoom his son to the earth. I'm glad he didn't Google meets him to the earth. Y'all still with me, ain't you? He didn't just put him on a screen and say, well, here he is. No, God sent his son and he dwelt with us. He doesn't give us a distant picture of him. He came and got dirty with us. He knew what it was like to be in the world, but not of the world. He was God in flesh with us so he could experience what it's like to be a human. Emmanuel. That's why Christ is not only the hope of Israel, which they have rejected him, but he is the hope of the whole world. Yes. Amen. 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 So let's finish this off. 
21 and 22, And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came and showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Stop right there. That's going to be another common tying thing together. That this sect, this the way, Christianity is spoken against. Amen. Y'all catch that phrase? That's a strong phrase. And this is increasingly true today. People are speaking out against Christians. I just shared with you that just this is within the last week or so, I had someone kind of say that. They said, you don't need to give a, an altar call. You don't need to do all that type of thing. You, you just simply need to be mindful where people are. And I'm thinking, because of where they are, that's why they need to be called to Christ. People will speak out. They are anti-Christ. They don't want to hear the name of Jesus. They don't want to hear that he died for their sins. There are many that are speaking out. If it was that way then, it is surely that way now. And when they had appointed him, verse 23, a day, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses. Circle that verse in your Bible or circuit, circle it on your handout. That, that, that's worth it all right there. God sent Paul to Rome so that he may send people to Paul. <laughs> Amen. God took Paul through all those things that he went through so that he may end up in Rome. And then what does it say? And when they had appointed him today, there came, to, there came many to him. They came to his lodging. Amen. Y'all y'all catching it? I, Paul, therefore the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm in literal chains, but beyond that, I'm in spiritual chains. I belong to him. And so I'm locked up and tied up and tangled up, but not in physical chains. I'm not worrying about that. I'm locked up, tied up and tangled up in Jesus. Amen. And people, whoever comes into my vicinity, if they come to see me, I'm going to expound to them the gospel. We don't house this treasure in earthen vessels. This, this is not something that, that's just so happenstance. We, we house this treasure, and it's not just an earthly treasure. It's a glorious spiritual treasure. It's the gospel. Amen? And get, get this. And some believed... The things which were spoke, spoken and some believe not. Don't overlook that. Don't be discouraged when it seems like nobody's listening. I've been there. I've been there. Y'all know I, I'm honest with you. I walk away. I tell you. I tell, I'm very candid with the church. There's no need to hide behind falsities and, and, and all these other things we put up. Pretenses if you want to call them that. There are some Sundays over the last six, seven, eight years as just a preacher in general. I have walked away and thought, what in the world did I do of anything? And that's right where the enemy wants you. Amen. We've got some lay speakers in here. We've got some people who have witnessed and are witnessing the people. We have some preachers in here. Don't ever let the enemy sell you that lie. If you have done what the Lord has asked you to do. If you have studied, if you have spent time before him in prayer and said, Lord, speak through me, never walk away and say, I struck out. Isaiah 55, 11 says, my word shall go forth and it will not return void. It is not on you. Amen. It's on the Lord to do what he wants. Some believed and some did not. Now, that sounds very familiar. You can find that. We won't read it now, but you can find that in um, um, Acts 14.4. You can find that in Acts 17. I do want to go to that one, Acts 17. So this is not something new. Paul has dealt with this. And I need to learn. You need to learn that when we share the message of Christ, some, may, some people may literally, utterly turn away and say, I don't want to hear that. I don't believe it. I don't care about it. Please stop talking. Then others may believe. Yes, sir. Why do people think that they can do better than the Apostle Paul who gave, you know, here we're reading the New Testament. Uh, mm -hmm. So they start 
thinking they're going to help God out by compromising. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, yeah. That that's the thing. When we don't see great numbers of people coming, we can, and it, it's easy to do. We can compromise to try to do things to to gain people. Quantity rather than quality. quality. Look at 17. We won't do four. Just go to 32. 17, 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some, these are ones that, that were listening to Paul, some mocked and some others said, we'll hear thee again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him. Amen. And what? Was that word? And believed. believed. So catch that. Outcomes. That he shared God's message. Some laughed. Some mocked. Some said, I don't know. I'll, I'll listen to you later. I'll, I'll, I'll put you on my save on YouTube and, and I'll catch you later. And then some believed. Don't get discouraged, Pain Creek. Amen. The great, late, great Andre Crouch wrote a song one time. I used to sing it years ago in a group that I was with. It says, tell them, even if they don't believe you. Tell them, even if they won't receive you. Tell them for me. Tell them that I love them. At the end of the day, all I can do is tell people the gospel. Tell people about Jesus Christ. And it is God who does the drawing. Amen. It is God, thank you, Lord. It is God who does the sustaining. It is God who holds them and, and, and keeps them where they need to be. All I can do is be faithful and tell the story. Amen? So, verse 25 through 28, and then we'll, we'll close this out in the next few verses. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. Here is a key verse we need to remember about fallen man. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, I should heal them. Amen. Then Paul says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. What has he been struggling with for the last several, several chapters? That his own folks wouldn't believe the message yes. and that the Gentiles were being stirred to salvation. That his own folks had a problem with somebody outside of them being benefiting of the message of the gospel that they didn't want. You, you know, it's not, it's not technical biblical, but they were kind of saying it this way. is one man's trash is another's treasure, but we don't even want you to have what we consider trash. <laughs> Amen. We, we don't want the gospel, but you're not good enough to have it either. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Think, think about it. Think about it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed in great reason among themselves. Now, in some manuscripts, they say that verse is, is not there. Uh, you can look and, and study that on your own. Verse 30, and Paul dwelt two, get this, two whole years in his own hired house as a prisoner, chained between guards sometimes, and received all that came in unto him. God said, okay, he, he didn't say, you know, we, we picture in our minds, he's going to Rome. He's going to stand in the, in the Colosseum. He's going to stand on the great steps. He's going to stand in all these places and declare the gospel. God didn't say how he's going to get to Rome. And he didn't say what was going to happen after he got to Rome. He just said, you will go there and declare my word. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's declaring it, but as he's chained to soldiers. As he's in, in a hired house, as he's in a, 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 as he's on watch guard, so to speak, house arrest. Y'all see it? I, I saw a meme the other day, my way versus God's way. Watch this. It showed the person standing here in a straight line and then a big heart. Then it said God's way. And it showed valleys and mountains and pitfalls and valleys 
and cactus bushes and seas and, and hills to cross over. And then at the end, it showed God being there with us. It, all of us would like just a straight path. Don't give me any obstacle courses, God. Don't give me any difficulties. Don't get, That's prosperity gospel, by the way. But the Lord said, I'm with you when you have to go into the valley. Even of the shadow of death. When you have to go through some things, I'll be with you through all that you may go through. Through thick and thin, through day and night, through up and downs, I am there with you. Amen. The last verse simply says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. We could stop right there for just a moment and simply say that is our calling. Amen. Ladies in the kitchen, folks on the usher board. Amen. Uh, the deacons who deek, as my pastor used to say, the singers who sing and, and the preachers who preach and all everybody else in between, whatever we do, let it be centered in Jesus Christ. Amen. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. As people came to him, as he's under house arrest, he's preaching Jesus. Catch this. And while he's there and people aren't coming, he is more than likely, he wrote the letters of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. He's encouraging folks with his pen as the Holy Spirit gives him utterance. Now, that word really fast and then we're done. Confidence. Does that make any sense to you? Confidence. Do you remember it? Acts 1 8 is our is our pivotal verse that I've pointed you to. But Acts 4:31 is probably my favorite verse in the Bible. And it just so happens that's going to be our associational theme. If you're watching that. Go back to Acts 4:31. Everybody, turn there. Acts 4:31. Now, this doesn't even have to do with Paul. It has to do with uh, Peter and John. Do you remember this? This was 24 chapters ago. And after they get out of jail, after preaching, and they've been told and commanded, don't you preach in the name of, of Jesus anymore. And they went and did it. They found him in the temple. And then they go to pray. And you all remember that lesson? They didn't get mad and post it on Facebook what had happened to them. They didn't go stand out on the street corner and, and tell folks off because they had been done wrong. They didn't do all those things. What does the Bible say they did? After they had told what had happened in the council, verse 29, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and their praying, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They didn't cry out. They didn't, they didn't get mad. They didn't put it in the newspaper and bold print. They went and prayed to God. How are you going to do it, God? By stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Same word in that verse is the same word that is confidence in verse 31. As the church started out, as the church is getting its marching orders, it has not changed. So that connects to our first question that I asked tonight. What should we be praying for in these days and times we live in? Boldness to preach, boldness to witness, boldness to declare the truth of God's word, to have confidence in doing it and say, Lord, whoever you send my way, let me tell them with boldness of your great love for them. What a connection. What a connection. That word is parashia, I believe is how it's pronounced, and it's a word for confidence and boldness of this first century church. Final point. Tonight, after meeting Christ, Paul turned from persecutor 
to persecute it. He lived out God's purpose through peril, persecution, and here's key, with passion to see the lost saved. This was the attitude of the early church, and we should model those same sentiments in the last days that we live in. Amen. Amen. I, for one, am elated to have gone through this whole book and seen what the Lord did in that first church, that early church, the early church, and where we are now. Uh, have we lost some things along the way? Most definitely. But through God's word, we can correct a lot of things. Amen. Amen. Be plumb, church. Get in God's word. Once again, if you have not uh, had the opportunity to get the handouts from all the previous classes, please do so. Go back through and read them. I do not know where we're going specifically uh, yet. We will next week is my, my uh, desire to have a review. I won't call it a test. We'll just call it a review. Uh, that's my desire. Uh, and then after that, we may, I don't know, we may go into the powerful book of Romans. We'll see what the Lord has to say about that. Questions or comments tonight? Have you enjoyed Acts? Yes. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Wonderful studies out there on Acts. Be careful of some of the things that you watch, but certainly... There are some things out there that are excellent uh, in studying the book of Acts and connecting it to where we are today. Uh, I'm reminded of what Jesus said uh, to Peter uh, when, when he asked him, who do men say that I am in Matthew 16? And he said, uh, uh, they say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, but who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I, will, and I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail mm -hmm. against it. And you can see Christ building his church through the apostles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the gates of hell is not prevailing against it. Yeah. You know, so even and though some same, don't believe and some reject, that's yeah. still the hand of God too. That same building <laughs> is on that truth. That truth specifically, yes. Right, right. I will build my truth. Anybody else? Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we are certainly glad to uh, to see you and, and to uh, see so many out. We pray that you invite some back uh, next week and come and see what the review will hold, see how well you paid attention. You can get those handouts, get your cheat sheets. It is not a test, so don't trip out. Um, and yes. then from there, I believe God will do something great through our next study. So we'll see what he has. If you have prayer requests tonight, you don't have to say them. Just wave your hand. God knows if somebody you're praying for, somebody in your family, mm -hmm. something that's going on. If you have prayer requests, just, just wave your hand. God knows. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, I thank you tonight. I acknowledge that you are God. And beside you, there is none other. You are a great God. You see us. You know us. Your word declares that you set high and look low. And yet in that setting high and looking low, you sent your son down to where we are. You met us in our time of need. Fallen man with no hope, no help, and, and nothing to, to, to gain. We have everything that we need in Christ. So I thank you tonight for salvation. I thank you for your shed blood. I thank you for forgiveness of sin. I thank you for the fact that we can repent of our sins and ask you to forgive us and turn from sin and to you and you meet us where we are. But Lord, you just don't leave us there. You grow us. You change us. You transform us. There is regeneration and that happens, Lord. There is transformation that happens and there's sanctification that is daily holiness that we are living and, and trying our best to please you and how we live. And one of these days, ultimately, when we see you, we will be just like you. Lord, hasten the day of your coming. Uh, Lord, uh, as I live longer and see the world in which we live, I can, I can only say what your word says. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, while you are coming, and you only know when that is, help us to be bold. 
Help us to be busy. Help us to be busy, not just in busyness, but busyness of sharing your word, sharing your transforming truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Now for all those requests, those who wave their hands, those who have requests heavy on their hearts tonight, Lord, we already know that you understand all of our troubles and you will guide until the day is done. So we thank you for your promises touched, Lord, whether it be physically, spiritually, financially, whatever is in need, God, and that is according to your will. We ask that you do above, exceedingly above, and all that we can ask or expect. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Pan Creek. Good to see you tonight. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday. If the Lord allows. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.